so we continue with the greeting on our service sheets. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we, who glory in this death for our salvation, may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Aloneness, Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sin, sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. <laughs>
Lord Jesus, you entered the garden of fear and faced the agony of your impending death. Be with those who share that agony and face death unwillingly this day. You shared our fear and knew the weakness of our humanity. Give strength and hope to the dispirited and despairing. To you, Jesus, who sweated blood, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Betrayal. Judas betrays Jesus. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. simple kiss, a sign of friendship. Judas identifies Jesus to the gang sent to capture the rabbi from Nazareth. 
with one simple kiss. The captive of darkness identifies the light of the world and so hands over the world's life to certain death. Perhaps we have stood where Jesus and Judas now stand. Like Judas, we felt betrayed by the failure of friends or family to meet our expectations or to be who we wanted them to be. Dare we judge Judas if he felt his hopes for the triumph of Israel had been dashed against the stones of the temple? Dare we accuse him if he took drastic action to force Jesus into declaring his kingdom on earth? Have we never acted in bitterness and anger to hurt or betray someone we loved? And Judas might still have loved Jesus, but why would he end his life when he sees what his betrayal has unleashed? Like Jesus, we felt the pain of offering love freely only to have it twisted and thrown back at us in scorn and bitterness. Jesus has seen conflicts within communities and families. A brother betraying his family by collecting families for the occupying forces. Sons fighting over inherited land. And people separated from their loved ones because of disease that makes them unclean and unwanted. Now he knows for himself the pain of a friend's desertion and betrayal. We can be overwhelmed by betraying darkness, add to its weight and send on its way to destroy other lives. Or we can watch Jesus. In one simple kiss, Jesus accepts and absorbs the darkness. He transforms it, redeeming the act of a friend turned enemy into a sign that even the darkness cannot overcome the light of the world. Jesus, you were betrayed by the kiss of a friend. Be with those who are betrayed and slandered and falsely accused. You knew the experience of having your love thrown back in your face for mere silver. Be with families which are torn apart by mistrust or temptation. To you, Jesus, who offered your face to your betrayer, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. denial. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway 
where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. We see Peter's anguish, but we also know his future. We know that on the seashore, Jesus will forgive him and restore him to a new life. He will be transformed into a man of courage and total dedication. Tonight, though, for Peter, the light of the world is extinguished. He's alone and afraid. He saw the hurt in his Lord's eyes and knows that his denial has brought more grief into the heart of a man who only loved and served his followers. Nothing will comfort Peter. He knows only fear, shame, guilt and self-hatred, and no one could judge and condemn him more than he does himself. It's hard to watch Peter to hear his denial and witness his tears. It's hard because we know only too well that sense of failure and shame at our lack of courage. Too often we act out a denial of knowing Jesus when we behave in selfish, resentful and defensive ways to protect ourselves from condemnation or ridicule. Peter followed Jesus as far as his human strength and courage would take him. Some of us might not have gone as far as the high priest's courtyard, but with our vision enlightened by the resurrection, we see more of Peter's story, and it reveals the way our story might unfold. Like Peter, we learn that in our own strength, we can go only so far in faith. Like Peter, we will learn to accept our failures and limitations so that we can be healed, restored and forgiven through the grace of God in Christ. Like Peter, we will come to understand the Jesus, the light of our life, can and will lead us out of the prison of guilt and self-hatred to start again in the freedom of grace and truth. Lord Jesus, as Peter betrayed you, you experienced the double agony of love rejected and friendship denied. Be with those who know no friends and are rejected by society. You understand the fear within Peter. Help us to understand the anxieties for those who fear for their future. To you, Jesus, who gazed with sadness at his lost friend, the honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
accusation. There is silence. All eyes are on Jesus, a compelling figure at the centre of this coming together of Jewish and Roman authority. Are you the king of the Jews? The question hangs in the air, so much depending on the reply. You say so. Like thunder rolling round a threatening sky, accusation after accusation is hurled at the innocent one. A vision like a splinter of light cuts through Pilate's confusion, political cynicism and fear for his own position. He sees a glimpse of a world far removed from the one he knows. In his mind, he searches for a way forward, a way that will release an innocent man, appease these vociferous religious rulers and safeguard the power of Rome. He seizes the opportunity that presents itself in Barabbas and makes his offer to the crowd to reject it with all the anger and hatred that they can muster. The moment is gone and Pilate loses sight of that other world. His choice is made. The strange alliance between oppressor and oppressed is forged as Pilate's hands hands Jesus over to torture and death. Today we are still unjustly accusing, judging and oppressing others because we cannot allow truth and justice to lighten our darkness. We deny the equality of all people. We refuse freedom of speech and tolerance of beliefs not our own. We twist all that we see and hear to justify our own self-interests. Whenever we deny and quash the truth, the one who is truth stands before us, waiting, loving, and believing that somehow, in the end, we will hear him and allow his presence to transform the darkness of injustice with his merciful light and life. <coughs> Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah, for he knew it was out of self-interest that they handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Lord Jesus, 
you were condemned to death for political expediency. Be with those who are imprisoned for the convenience of the powerful. You were the victim of unbrun unbridled injustice. Change the minds and motivations of oppressors and exploiters to your way of peace. To you, Jesus, innocent though condemned, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and for ever. Amen.
suffering, the soldiers mock Jesus. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. What it is to be soldiers of the great Roman Empire. We can flog a man almost to death, and then when he's bleeding, nearly senseless and totally powerless, we taunt him and mock him and abuse his humanity. We can do it because we are so great and powerful and strong. I'm not squeamish. I can prove myself in battle as well as any man. I can stand against an enemy who's worthy of a fight. But this Jesus was no threat to the authority of Rome. I've heard him teaching, watched him healing, and wondered whether he might be right about God and love. They say he was an imposter, a self-proclaimed Messiah, who had to be silenced once and for all. They're making us do the dirty work of execution, but I think they're wrong. As he reels from the blows, his blood, sweat and tears mask the life and light I once saw in his eyes. And when those tortured eyes meet mine, I see in them only honesty and integrity. I have to look away. The scourging is done, his skin flayed to the very bone. Let him go, let him find relief for his pain. This should be the end of it, but it's not. Now we have to crucify him if he lives long enough. I don't know what we're doing. I do know there are people here who will live to regret this day. Jesus, don't look at me in that way. Maybe you are right in what you said, but it's too late now. You're as good as dead and there's nothing I can do. I have orders to follow. The kingdom of your God, in the end, has no power, and we are the great Roman Empire. Lord Jesus, you faced the torment of barbaric punishments and mocking tongue. <coughs> Be with those who cry out in physical agony and emotional distress. You endured unbearable abuse. Be with those who face torture and mockery today. To you, Jesus, the King crowned with thorns, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
crucifixion. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days save yourself come down from the cross if you are the son of god in the same way the chief priests the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him he saved others they said but he can't save himself he's the king of israel let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. They crucified him. Three stark words to describe an act so brutal that few can bear to watch it happen. Hammers driving nails through flesh into wood. Blood staining the ground beneath the body. The sound of human agony and the dreadful indifference of the torturers. No wonder the people who tell this story never dwell on this final act. He was crucified and felt in his body all the physical pain that human beings can inflict on each other. They divided his clothes among them. They stripped him, exposed his torn flesh and lifted up his naked body, shaming and humiliating him by turning his final hours into an exhibition for all who passed by. Turning their backs on the man they treated as anything but human, they cast lots for his clothes. What sort of trophy is it that is taken off a powerless man when he can do nothing to resist? This is a man who loves his enemy even now and would gladly give his shirt or walk the extra mile. They didn't need to take from him. They had nothing to fear from him. The wounds now inflicted on Jesus will leave their scars. They are for us signs of the promise that when we are hurt, we will be healed. When we are broken, we will be made whole. When we are shamed and humiliated, we will find dignity restored. And when we suffer the darkness of loneliness and isolation, God's loving presence will surround us. We will carry the scars, but we will also be transformed and made new in body, mind and spirit within the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you bled in pain as the nails were driven into your flesh transform through the mystery of your love the pain of those who suffer to you jesus our crucified lord be honor and glory with the father and the holy spirit now and forever amen
death. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, labas, labas abaktene, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Is it nothing to you that warned you that pass by? Look and see if there be any sorrow like my sorrow. Broken, grieving and forsaken, the heart of the Son of Man is stilled by death, and the pain is felt by the great heart which sustains the life of all creation. For an infinitesimal fraction of a second, it is as if the entire universe suffers with the one through whom it came into being. In that undetectable splinter of time, the darkness believes it has overcome the light it hates. But the truth is that in that splinter, all things are made new. Never again can there be any doubt that love, light and life are at the heart of all that is, seen and unseen. And because love, light and life are at the heart of all that is, we know that one day chaos will give way to patterns of order. Apparently random and meaningless events will give way to purpose and design. Hatred and violence will give way to the redemption of love and healing. As Jesus gives one loud, desperate cry and breathes his last, we know the truth. On the cross, something new is being revealed. So let the cross be a symbol of meaning, purpose, love, and above all, new life in the one whose life was ended by the darkness of our world, but whose spirit is the light which enlightens everyone. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? No, Lord, it is everything to us. On the cross is the new revelation of the reality of your presence in our suffering. And in that revelation we see your glory the glory of a Father, only Son, full of grace and truth. Lord Jesus, you died on the cross and entered the bleakest of all circumstances. Give courage to those who die at the hands of others. In death, you entered into the darkest place of all, Illumine our darkness with your glorious presence. To you, Jesus, your lifeless body hanging on the tree of shame, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.